It was my fault. I could barely speak, merely echoing my mother-in-law Aria's words. That's exactly what I mean. If it weren't for you, none of this would have happened. I do not acknowledge you as Noel's wife. You're not suitable. That's what I mean. Why, why all of a sudden? Why say such things? I asked, my voice trembling. It's a problem that you've lied this long without understanding such things. Realize it. It's true what they say. Children from low-level single-parent homes have issues. Seeing you has only reinforced that belief, she replied. My name is Sierra. I'm a 35-year-old office worker living with my husband and her elementary school-aged child. We've been a family of three since the beginning of our marriage and lived close to my husband, Noel's family home. We maintained a good relationship while keeping a comfortable distance. The turning point in our relationship with my father-in-law and Aria came a few years ago. They always cared for us and we were grateful, but father-in-law passed away after a long illness. Aria's grief at losing him was painfully evident to me. Considering Noel's commute, we planned to move, but seeing Aria's condition made leaving her alone worrisome. Noel and I discussed it many times and decided to stay put until Aria's situation stabilized. That's when it started. Slowly but surely, Aria began to overstep our personal space. When my father-in-law was alive, Aria never visited our home unnecessarily. She never came unannounced, at least not as far as I knew. But now, she suddenly started showing up without any notice. It began as a day or two, but recently she's been at our house half the week. If only she gave prior notice, I could bear it, but entertaining Aria when she's so unpleasant is disheartening, especially since she only brings up unpleasant conversations. Sierra, you're always home late, aren't you? Are you that busy with work? Are you taking proper care of Noel? She would ask. What exactly do you mean by proper care? I replied, trying to stay calm. Just what I said. Are you serving nutritious meals and looking after his health? Noel is the pillar of our family, my precious son. You're not just serving him frozen meals and hot deli food because you're short on time, are you? She glanced at the freezer, her demeanor suggesting she might just open it. Well, not always, but sometimes yes. Noel tells me not to overdo it too, I stammered. Really? But just because you discuss it with Noel doesn't mean you can neglect proper meals. It's just laziness. You should be able to manage that, considering Noel's health. What are your thoughts on this? Aria's tone grew harsher with every word. I'm sorry, Aria. I try, but it's hard to find the time, I said feeling more and more defeated. That's just laziness. I've worked for many years. I understand the difficulties of working women. But despite that, I've overcome and provided healthy meals and maintained our household for my husband and Noel. From my experience, not having time is just an excuse. Stop making excuses, Sierra. Show some responsibility as a homemaker in charge of your family's health. I can't rest easy otherwise, she lectured. Aria, a longtime middle school teacher, always judge everything by her standards without considering others. Since a minor incident in middle school due to my family background, I've had a poor impression of teachers, including Aria. I understand she cares about our family in her way, which is why I can't say anything and just listen during her lectures. But maybe my attitude seemed unreliable as Aria's behavior gradually changed. Before, she used to come unannounced to lecture or make snide remarks, but lately she started bringing homemade meals, always in such large quantities that our family couldn't finish them in one go, mostly Noel's favorites. At first, I thanked her for her efforts. Encouraged by this, Aria began bringing food daily. Sierra, I understand you're busy, but can't you come home earlier? The meals I prepare get cold because I can't get them inside. I want Noel to eat them while they're hot, she said. I'm sorry. I do want to come home early, but it's just a busy period at work right now, I explained. But you say that, yet isn't it just that you're not good at your job? I heard on TV recently that people who are good at their jobs manage to leave on time. On the contrary, those who aren't good stay late and work overtime. It's like they were talking about you, Sierra. Aren't you, in fact, not good at your job? Aria always had a mean look on her face when she said such things. No, that's not it. I think I do my job well enough, I replied, trying to defend myself. Displeased with my attitude, Aria's face clearly showed her annoyance. I'm only making and bringing these meals because you always serve hot deli food. Don't you understand that if you come home late because of work, it's all for nothing? Don't you feel even a bit sorry for receiving all these meals I've made? 
She spoke as if expecting gratitude was a given. I never asked her to cook for us, neither did Noel. Of course, I thanked her and accepted the meals. But it was all area imposing her goodwill. To me, it was a nuisance, a beat one I was grateful for. Then one day, Aria said something that pushed me to my limit. See you, I've been thinking, you're never home when I visit, right? To avoid wasting these meals, I think it's better if I also have a key to your house. That way, I can drop off the food anytime. Plus, with things being unsafe these days, I can quickly come over if something happens. Just ask Noel to give me a spare key, okay? Aria's request left me stunned. Hearing this, I realized I couldn't handle it alone anymore. I needed to talk to Noel about Aria. Noel, I need to talk to you about your mom. I can't handle this by myself anymore, I said, my voice shaking. Mom's issue? What happened? He asked, concerned. Aria visits our house daily, always without any notice. I do my best to accommodate her when I can, but I can't always be available. I have my own schedule, too, I explained. Yeah, I get it he said sympathetically, and now she wants a spare key to our house. It's hard enough as it is, but if she can enter when we're not home, that's unbearable. If we give her one, she might start coming over all the time. Just the thought is frightening. I'm sorry to speak this way about your mom, I confessed. Seriously, mom said that. I don't like the idea of her coming in with a spare key either. Okay, I understand. It might be hard for you to say, so I'll talk to her clearly about it. Noel promised. I felt relieved, glad I had talked to Noel. The next day, while I was at work, Aria called. Sierra, what time will you be home today? She asked. What do you mean? I replied, confused. Well, I made too much beef stew, Noel's favorite. I thought I'd bring it over. So what time will you be home? She explained. I see. In that case, I should be home a little after seven, so I'll definitely be there by 7.30, I said. All right. I'll come around then. Thanks, Aria replied. It might have been the first time Aria called before visiting. Noel must have talked to her already. I was impressed by how quickly things change, but honestly, I didn't just want her to call before visits, I wanted her to stop visiting altogether. That was my true wish, but for now, I was genuinely happy she called in advance. Aria's visit frequency didn't change, but she started calling beforehand, which significantly reduced my stress. However, after a while, I noticed something odd. I started running into Aria more often when I was out. At first, I thought it was a coincidence, like when our family went shopping on the weekend or when I went to buy toys with my child, or even bumped into her at the station on a weekday evening. Meeting her this frequently seemed too much for coincidence, but strangely, nothing more happened. We'd bump into each other, exchange greetings, explain what we were doing. And that was it. It never led to anything else. Maybe that's why, before I knew it, I had become accustomed to this situation. One holiday, while this was going on, we decided to clean the house before the delivery of a sofa set Noel had wanted for a while. We planned to place it in the living room, so that was our primary focus for cleaning. But before we knew it, both Noel and I got carried away and started cleaning the kitchen and bedroom too. It was a completely accidental discovery. In a corner of the bedroom, there was an inconspicuous outlet that seemed unlikely to ever be used. Only a double outlet adapter was plugged in there. I didn't remember buying it, nor placing it there. Noel didn't recall it either. Both of us felt something was off. Without saying a word to each other, we started checking all the outlets in the house. We found one mysterious outlet adapter each in the kitchen and living room, and another in the bedroom, making three in total. By then we had a feeling about what it might be, but we were too scared to put it into words. It's like those things you see on TV sometimes, isn't it? Who would do this and why? I said, breaking the silence. Where's the banking card? Noel suddenly asked, startling me. What? What do you mean? I was confused, not understanding what Noel meant. Noel, noticing my confusion, asked slowly and clearly, Is our banking card here? Has it gone missing? Noel seemed to have his own thoughts on the matter and quickly checked. After confirming the banking card was safe, Noel put his finger to his lips and quietly moved us to the living room. We might be bugged, so it's better not to talk about it there. We should be safe here. It's far enough, he said to reassure me. Should we call the police in this situation? I asked, starting to panic. Noel stopped me. It's good to report to the police, but let's wait. 
Reporting without knowing who did it might just waste time. I have an idea. We can report it after this, Noel said as he shared his plan with me. Honestly, upon hearing it, I wanted to report it immediately, but Noel seemed to have a hunch. That night, we put the double outlet back in its original place, wrapped in newspaper with a fan blowing on it continuously. At 2 a.m., the front door quietly opened and a figure entered, heading straight to the living room. The person picked up the double outlet, inspecting it closely. We captured all these actions on camera and, without any warning, turned on the living room lights. The figure panicked at the sudden light. I was momentarily stunned upon seeing the person, but it also felt expected. It was Aria. So it was you. We need an explanation, Mom, Noel spoke calmly, but there was an underlying anger. Aria turned her anger towards me instead. Sierra, what is this all about? Even in this situation, she seemed to not understand her position. I just came to check on something, and now even Noel is looking at me like that. What's going on? Don't play dumb. What were you checking by sneaking into our house in the middle of the night? Noel demanded. What does it matter? More importantly, why are you two so angry with me? Aria deflected. You still don't get it. This was all my husband's idea. We're the ones asking for an explanation, not you, I said, trying to stay calm. Aria, if you have something to say, answer our questions first, Noel insisted. Sierra's right. If you're going to play dumb, we'll call the police. Understand. Noel's voice was cold and Aria's attitude shifted as if she realized there was no other way. Reporting to the police? That's an overreaction. We're family. There's no need for such formalities. This is all a misunderstanding, so let's not make a big deal out of it, Aria pleaded. A misunderstanding? Then you better explain yourself clearly to clear it up, unless we're not convinced. Still claiming it's a misunderstanding at this point, there must be a good reason for it, right, Mom? Noel pressed. Well, it's just, you know, Loneliness. I was lonely, so I did it, Aria admitted. Lonely? So you were bugging us, and you expect us to accept that? I said, incredulous. All this time, Aria's unannounced visits and frequent encounters when we were out were because she had been eavesdropping and monitoring our movements. Unaware of this, I struggled with the invasion of my personal space by Aria and even blamed myself, thinking I had a problem for not being able to handle it well. I had pushed myself almost to my limit, but it was all because Aria had been eavesdropping. I felt a mix of relief that it wasn't my fault and anger towards Aria's actions, which made my tone and attitude towards her naturally harsher. Do you really think that reason is enough for us to be satisfied? What you're doing, Aria, is absolutely inexcusable. Don't you understand that? I demanded. Sierra's right, Mom. We can't accept that reason and we can't forgive what you've been doing. I hate to say it, but what you're doing is wrong. If things continue like this, we can't have a relationship like before, Noel said firmly. Wait, Noel, I'm your parent. How can you say such terrible things to your own mother? You weren't like this before, were you? Aria's face was like that of a forlorn stray cat seeking pity. But Noel was even colder and more distant. Who's causing this, Mom? You won't admit your own actions and your reasons are selfish. It's obviously wrong. Enough is enough. We're leaving here. Of course we won't tell you where we're moving. Noel, why? Aria pleaded. Aria, please stop. You've betrayed your own son. Don't you understand how he feels? I added, hoping to make her see reason. It seemed the words from her son deeply shocked Aria. She was visibly shaken and blustered. All I wanted was to hear an apology from Aria for her to admit her wrongdoing and then discuss what to do next. But as soon as I spoke, she glared at me with intense hostility. Quiet, you've been saying whatever you want. It's all because of you that I did this. If you hadn't been here, I wouldn't have had to do any of this. If only you hadn't married Noel. I couldn't comprehend the sudden outburst from Aria. My fault? My fault? I managed to speak, only echoing Aria's words. That's exactly what I mean. If it weren't for you, none of this would have happened. I do not acknowledge you as Noel's wife. You're not suitable. That's what I mean. Why? Why say such things so suddenly? I asked, bewildered. It's a problem that you've lived this long without understanding such things. Realize it. It's true what they say. Children from low-level single-parent homes often have issues. Seeing you has only reinforced that belief. 
Aria spat. Noel, finally catching up to the situation, hurriedly tried to stop Aria. Mom, what are you saying all of a sudden? Do you realize what you're saying? Yes, I understand perfectly. I thought he would feel constrained by marrying a woman from such a low-level family. That's why I was monitoring to prevent any problems. It's all for your sake, Noel. Aria confessed. We were baffled by Aria's sudden confession, especially Noel, who seemed to be seeing this side of his mother for the first time. He was unsure how to react. My confusion was different from Noel's. I was perplexed by the words Aria had spoken to me. I had heard those words before. Why had Aria spoken them? That was my confusion. Eventually, I remembered something and asked Aria, I heard you were a middle school teacher. Is that true? My seemingly unrelated question caused an exaggerated reaction in Aria, and from her response, something clicked for me. If you were a middle school teacher, you must know many other teachers, right? There's a teacher I can't forget. Is she perhaps an acquaintance of yours? I mentioned a name. Upon hearing it, Aria became visibly shaken and stuttered. Why that name? I thought so. It's connected. Seeing Aria's reaction, I was certain my suspicions were correct. The name I had mentioned was that of my middle school homeroom teacher. I mentioned my middle school homeroom teacher. From your reaction, Aria, it seems you know her. Actually, I was treated terribly by that teacher and got into some trouble. It seems like you've heard about it, haven't you? The trouble with my former teacher was related to my family background. My parents divorced when I was in elementary school, and I was taken in by my mom. My mom always told me that the divorce was due to a personality clash, not because they hated each other. In fact, even after the divorce, my father and I kept in touch regularly. We even had family dinners together several times. Both my parents worked, but they had different life rhythms. There were many mismatches, so they decided it was better to live separately for both of their sakes. Even though they were divorced, I didn't really feel like they were. However, my former homeroom teacher didn't see it that way. She labeled me as a problem child because I came from a single-parent family. Children from low-level single-parent homes are often problematic. I was told directly, no matter how much I tried to explain, she wouldn't listen. To make things worse, she had a troublesome way of managing the class. She believed in uniting the class by targeting one student. By making one student the scapegoat, the rest of the class would come together. She believed in this method, and I became the target. The reason was simple. I was raised in a single-parent family. Perhaps she thought it was okay to do anything to a problematic child like me. Of course, I couldn't accept such reasoning and resisted desperately. Because one of the reasons was my parents' divorce, I couldn't tell them about the treatment I received from the teacher. Resisting as a middle schooler wasn't easy. When I was cornered beyond my capacity, I finally opened up to my parents. I told them how the teacher was treating me. Fortunately, my parents acted quickly upon hearing my story. There was an immediate discussion with my parents and a teacher, and the issue was resolved. The teacher resigned as the class homeroom teacher and left the school unexpectedly in the middle of the year. The issue was resolved quickly after I confided in my parents, but I still remember it vividly. It was that significant of an event. That's why I reacted to Aria's words. If she was acquainted with such a former teacher, I could easily imagine what she had been told about me, but that didn't make me feel any sympathy for Aria. I understood too well what she thought of me. It seems, Aria, you didn't hear the whole story from your acquaintance. If you had, you wouldn't have done such a thing. The whole story. What are you talking about? Aria asked. Yes, I was raised in a single-parent home with my mom, but you might not know that I was frequently in contact with my father. Indeed, my parents divorced due to personality differences, but there was another reason. Their work. And by the way, my father is a lawyer. Maybe I'm telling you this for the first time, but I am a lawyer's daughter. Knowing that someone related to legal expertise is involved, you can understand what your actions mean, right? What? No, that's a lie. Who would believe that? Aria exclaimed. My former teacher reacted the same way when I told her. You two are quite similar. I didn't hear anything. I haven't heard such a story, Aria insisted. No, of course, no one shares inconvenient truths with others. It's natural. Aria's attitude changed completely from her earlier confidence. No one could imagine being bugged by someone whose relative is a lawyer. It's obvious how dangerous that would be for oneself. If I tell my father about what you did, you understand what might happen, right? 
it could become a bigger issue than you think. Stop, please. Don't say that. Please, I beg you. Don't tell anyone about this. Please, I beg you, Aria pleaded. If that's the case, then answer our questions. Okay, yes, I'll answer. Please, I beg of you. So you heard everything about me from that acquaintance. Yes, that's right. When I mentioned your name, they seemed to know, and then. And then they started telling me about it. Yes, I thought if I found a weakness, I could somehow get Noel to divorce you. I see, that's clear now. I thought this was probably her true intention. From Aria's demeanor, it didn't seem like she had anything else to hide. At the same time, I was somewhat shocked to know she thought this way about me. Mom, I have no intention of leaving Sierra, just so you know, Noel said to Aria in a firm tone. I don't understand what you dislike about Sierra or why you did this, and I don't want to know. But Sierra is an important wife and family member to me. Unfortunately, I think it's better if we don't meet any more to protect my family. That's it. Yes. Aria could barely respond to Noel's clear declaration of cutting ties, understandably overwhelmed by his decision. The next day, at Noel's insistence, we reported the eavesdropping to my father and the police. We also sent a warning to the former teacher through my father. Surprisingly, the former teacher had no knowledge of Aria's actions. However, given that the teacher's remarks had led to the situation, we strongly demanded she never speak of it again. I can imagine how formidable my father must have been in his anger, but she must have been frightened enough of him. We even received a written pledge that she would never involve herself with us again. After ensuring all these matters were resolved, our family moved. We chose a location near Noel's workplace but didn't inform Aria at all. As a precaution, we blocked Aria's contact information. Not just me, but Noel did the same. I heard from neighbors near the in-law's house that Aria, who had been a longtime educator with a good reputation, became widely known for her deeds when the police got involved. Rumors sparked more rumors, and Aria began to be viewed coldly by everyone in the neighborhood, eventually being left alone. Now, Aria is said to be living alone in her house, with no one visiting her, almost unrecognizable from her former self. Even after hearing about Aria's current situation, I had no intention of forgiving her. In my mind, I've resolved to act as if Aria never existed from the start. Now that I have no ties with Aria, I plan to cherish my family even more.